Part 3 For a few weeks, he had talked only once with Mr. Katanzara. And though the changemaker had said nothing more about the books, asked no questions, his silence made George a little uneasy. For a while, George didn't pass in front of Mr. Katanzara's house anymore, until one night, forgetting himself, he approached it from a different direction than he usually did when he did. It was already past midnight. The street, except for one or two people, was deserted. And George was surprised when he saw Mr. Katanzara still reading his newspaper by the light of the street lamp overhead. His impulse was to stop at the stoop and talk to him. He wasn't sure what he wanted to say, though he felt the words would come when he began to talk. But the more he thought about it, the more the idea scared him. And he decided he'd better not. He even considered beating it home by another street, but he was too near Mr. Katanzara, and the changemaker might see him as he ran and get annoyed. So George unobtrusively crossed the street, trying to make it seem as if he had to look in a store window on the other side, which he did, and then went on, uncomfortable at what he was doing. He feared Mr. Katanzara would glance up from his paper and call him a dirty rat for walking on the other side of the street. But all he did was sit there, sweating through his undershirt, his bald head shining in the dim light as he read his times. And upstairs, his fat wife leaned out of the window, seeming to read the paper along with him. George thought she would spy him and yell out to Mr. Katanzara, but she never moved her eyes off her husband. George made up his mind to stay away from the changemaker until he had got some of his soft back books read. But when he started them and saw they were mostly story books, he lost his interest and didn't bother to finish them. He lost his interest in reading other things, too. Sophie's magazines and newspapers went unread. She saw them piling up on a chair in his room and asked why he was no longer looking at them. And George told her it was because of all the other reading he had to do. Sophie said she had guessed that was it. So for most of the day, George had the radio on, turning to music when he was sick of the human voice. He kept the house fairly neat, and Sophie said nothing on the days when he neglected it. She was still kind and gave him his extra buck, though things weren't so good for him as they had been before. But they were good enough, considering. Also, his night walks invariably picked him up, no matter how bad the day was. Then, one night, George saw Mr. Katanzara coming down the street toward him. George was about to turn and run, but he recognized from Mr. Katanzara's walk that he was drunk, and if so, probably he would not even bother to notice him. So George kept on walking straight ahead until he came abreast of Mr. Katanzara. And though he felt wound up enough to pop into the sky, he was not surprised when Mr. Katanzara passed him without a word, walking slowly, his face and body stiff. George drew a breath in relief at this narrow escape when he heard his name called, and there stood Mr. Katanzara at his elbow, smelling like the inside of a beer barrel. His eyes were sad as he gazed at George, 
and George felt so intensely uncomfortable, he was tempted to shove the drunk aside and continue on his walk. But he couldn't act that way to him. And besides, Mr. Katanzara took a nickel out of his pants pocket and handed it to him. Go buy yourself a lemon ice, Georgie. It's not that time any more, Mr. Katadara, George said. I am a big guy now. No, you ain't, said Mr. Katanzara, to which George made no reply he could think of. And how are all your books coming along now? Mr. Katanzara asked. Though he tried to stand steady, he swayed a little. Fine, I guess, said George, feeling the red crawling up his face. You ain't sure? The changemaker smiled slyly, a way George had never seen him smile. Sure, I'm sure. They're fine. Though his head swayed in little arcs, Mr. Katanzara's eyes were steady. He had small blue eyes, which could hurt if you looked at them too long. George, he said, Name me one book on that list that you read this summer, and I will drink to your health. I don't want anybody drinking to me. Name me one, so I can ask you a question on it. Who can tell? If it's a good book, maybe I might want to read it myself. George knew he looked passable on the outside but inside he was crumbling apart. Unable to reply, he shut his eyes. But when, years later, he opened them, he saw that Mr. Katanzara had, out of pity, gone away. But in his ears, he still heard the words he had said when he left. George, don't do what I did. The next night, he was afraid to leave his room, and though Sophie argued with him, he wouldn't open the door. What are you doing in there? she asked. Nothing. Aren't you reading? No. She was silent a minute, then asked, Where do you keep the books you read? I never see any in your room outside of a few cheap, trashy ones. He wouldn't tell her. In that case, you're not worth a buck of my hard-earned money. Why should I break my back for you? Go on out, you bum. Get a job. He stayed in his room for almost a week, except to sneak into the kitchen when nobody was home. Sophie railed at him, then begged him to come out, and his old father wept, but George wouldn't budge, though the weather was terrible and his small room stifling. He found it very hard to breathe. Each breath was like drawing a flame into his lungs. <laughs>